welcome everyone to tonight's special Citizens Climate Lobby webinar program. We are so lucky to have our special guest and esteemed advisory board member, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, join us. I'll be your host this evening, along with CCL's communication director, Flannery Winchester. And tonight's topic is focus on a conversation with Dr. Catherine Hayhoe about her new book, Saving Us. Before I pass the baton, I just wanted to ground us in what an honor it is to have the esteemed presenter and speaker we have tonight. Dr. Catherine Hayhoe is an atmospheric scientist whose research focuses on understanding what climate change means for people and the places where we live. She is the chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy and a Horn Distinguished Professor and Endowed Professor of Public Policy and Public Law at the Department of Political Science at Texas Tech University. Her book, Saving Us, A Climate Scientist's Case for Hope and Healing in a Divided World, it is released. And that is why we're uh, having a chance to talk about it tonight. It's been featured on the New York Times, Scientific America, Jimmy Kimmel Live, on Being with Chris Tippett, you name it, it's been talked about. And we are lucky to have her here for a CCL special. And just a fun little fact, Dr. Hayhoe has been named one of Time's 100 Most Influential People, the UN's Champion of the Environment, and the World Evangelical Alliance's Climate Ambassador. And so we are so lucky to have you, Dr. Hayhoe. And it's just a little sneak peek I'm quickly gonna read my favorite paragraph from the book. So for those of us that have brought our books along tonight, uh, you can open up to page 83. And I think this is just a really great snapshot into why this book is so empowering and helpful in filling us with hope in this time, especially. And it starts by saying this. So how do we move beyond fear or shame? By acting from love, I believe. Love starts with speaking truth making people fully aware of the risks and the choices they face in a manner that is relevant and practical to them. But it also offers compassion, understanding, and acceptance, the opposite of guilt and shame. Love bolsters our courage too, what we will not do for those and those that we love. And finally, it opens the door to that most ephemeral and sought after of emotions, hope, you do such a wonderful job of instilling in all of us that very emotion. Dr. Hayhoe, thank you for joining us tonight and the floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me. Well, what you didn't choose is the sections in the book about citizens climate lobby. And in fact, I want to share my favorite reaction to the book, which the reactions have just been absolutely amazing. So people have been posting pictures of it. Um, somebody posted a picture the other day saying it was my birthday. And my, one of my friends came over and left me a present on my porch and look what she left me. And they, it was a picture of the book. But somebody else said, I loved reading the book and I realized that I could take action. And so you know what I did? I joined Citizens Climate Lobby. <laughs> That's what they did as a result of reading the book. So this book is a tremendous tool. I have spoken to CCLers across not just the US, but Canada and Europe as well. And you have asked me consistently the same question. How do I have positive, constructive conversations with people about this issue? Well, that's why I wrote the book, literally. So I just feel like everybody at CCL should be reading the book because I wrote it to answer your questions and it tells people about CCL and introduces CCL, CCL too. So please do read the book, share the book with people because it is exactly what you have been asking me for for the last when did I start, first start serving as your science advisor? But do you remember, was it five years ago, six years ago? I think at least six, yeah. At least six, maybe seven years ago. So since I first became your science advisor, you have been asking me the questions that this book answers. So really this book is for you. And I'm here to talk about it tonight. I'm here to take your questions, but I have a request for you, which is please get the book, read the book, and share the book with people because this is the book that I know CCL wants. All right, can you, let's see, do we have a link for the book? That we yes, absolutely, there? I'll put that right now in the chat. Okay, excellent, and Scott says, just got the book. Good, thank you, Scott. I would add, you can get the book as an ebook, you can get the book as an Audible, and in fact, I read the Audible myself. Or you can get it, of course, as a hardcover too. Doesn't matter to me, just get it any way you want. And there's a nice little link in the chat there that has links to independent booksellers online. You can get it from your local bookstore. You can get it, as, again, as an Audible or a Kindle or a Nook, or you can also order from Amazon. So remember, don't put your questions in the Q&A on Zoom. Put your questions in PolyV. PolyV is now open. If you look at it on your phone, it looks like this. And I'm super excited because this is the only time I've ever used PolyV where it wasn't me running it. 
So thank you. <laughs> well, we have I use this all the time. It. If, if, <laughs> if you've liked Pulley View for any CCL feature, it's because of Dr. Hayhoe. We learned it from you. Excellent. Oh, college, oh, college library. Great. Get it from the library or get your library to buy it too. That's fantastic. All right. So let me start here. Let me share my screen and share a few thoughts I have with you. And then again, don't forget, you can add your questions at any time to Pulley V and you can upvote the questions you most want us to discuss. Flannery and I are coming back on afterwards and we will be answering your questions. So first of all, why is the book called Saving Us? Normally, when you see a book about climate change, you're gonna see it called something like Saving the Planet or saving the trees, or possibly saving the whales. I called it saving us because it is not about saving the planet. The planet will be orbiting the sun long after we are gone. Somebody said today, I've started to collect how many times I hear this, and I hear it every day, and today what somebody said to me was, the planet needs us. I said, no, the planet doesn't need us. In fact, it might be better off arguably without us. We are the ones who need to be saved. We cannot float around in outer space, clutching our precious economy to our bosom, so to speak, without the resources that this planet provides. It literally is about saving us. And by us, I mean us humans. And I also mean many of the other living things that share this planet with us. I am not worried about the cockroaches. I'm not worried about, you know, all of the invasive species in the kudzu. I think the cockroaches and the kudzu will be just fine. I am worried about us and about many other of the species that share this home with us. How does climate change affect us? It affects every single one of us by impacting the quantity and the quality of our water. We can't survive without water. It affects the air that we breathe. We cannot survive without breathable air. It affects the food that we eat. We can't survive without food either, right? And it affects all of our infrastructure. Our buildings, our roads, our energy systems, our water systems, all of the infrastructure that we have built for a planet that no longer exists. All of our human systems are designed for a climate of the past, not the future. That's why, as I often say, to care about climate change, you and I, any of us, only have to be one thing. And that one thing is a human being living on planet Earth. And if you are that, then you care. And if you don't think you care, it is simply because you haven't connected the dots between what you already care about, whatever that is, and how climate change is affecting it. For one person, it could be their kids. For somebody else, it could be the place they live. For someone else, it could be tennis. For somebody else, it could be beer. Whoever you are, whoever they are, they already have every reason they need to care. And so you don't have to convince someone to care for the same reasons you do. You just have to get to know them, figure out what makes them tick, and then connect the dots between what they already care about and why this matters. That is a lot easier than trying to make somebody care about something they don't want to care about, right? So I wrote this book because of two questions that I got every time I talked to a CCL chapter, every time I talked at the national meeting, every time I spoke to a group of university students or a community group or a faith group or a group of business people. Wherever I've spoken the last five years, I've gotten two questions. And that's why I wrote the book is to answer those two questions. What is question number one? What gives you hope? Now, I wanna to start to answer this question with what doesn't give me hope because all too often we look for hope in all the wrong places and then we get disappointed again and again until we give up. There are people today who have given up and that just breaks my heart because only when we give up are we truly doomed. If we give up, we will be doomed. And somehow by putting their faith and their hope in the wrong places, they have decided it isn't worth it and we can't fix it. So that's where I want to start. When we put our hope in science, showing us that it's okay, it's not that bad, or in a specific political leader or a specific bill or a specific thing, piece of legislation, party, whatever, we are going to be disappointed. In the science, the news just gets worse and worse. Drought in Madagascar, 
heat waves in British Columbia. This week, look at the dates here, October 18th, driest year in California's century. October 25, California rain breaks records. Our headlines are getting more dire by the day. Do you know that we used to experience on average three months in between billion dollar weather and climate disasters in the United States? They would be on average three months before you had a billion dollar weather or climate disaster somewhere in the US. You know what we're at now? Two and a half weeks. Two and a half weeks between billion dollar weather and climate disasters. And you know what's it, what it's gonna be in a few years? Two weeks. And after that, a week and a half. The news headlines are dire. And when we look at the politics, it is not much better. Just before COVID, Pew ranked the most politically polarized issues in the country. The width of the gray bar shows how far apart Republicans and Democrats are on the issue. So the wider the gray bar, the further apart they are. And what bar is at the top? Climate change. Well, then along came issues like Black Lives Matter, racial justice, and of course, coronavirus, vaccines, masks, lockdowns. What happened to this list? Well, right there at the top, we have addressing issues around race, dealing with global climate change, and dealing with the COVID outbreak. And you might say, oh, climate change isn't number one anymore. You know why it's not number one? Because the Democrats dropped. That's why it's not number one. Not because the, the Republicans moved up, the Democrats moved down. So that does not give me a lot of hope. And I can tell you when I start to look at the injustice of the impacts, that does not give me hope either. Did you know that the poorest 50% of people in the world are responsible for 7% of emissions? Poorest half of the world, 7% of emissions. And when you look at who's most affected by climate change, it's women and children, especially in low income countries. It's indigenous peoples who have already lost so much. It's black and brown neighborhoods right here in the United States that have been redlined by racist practices by insurance and mortgage and bank companies that have left their neighborhoods located in flood zones next to hazardous waste sites, full of concrete without green spaces, trees. This is that picture is actually not that representative without lawns or green spaces. So when a heat wave comes along, their neighborhoods can be 15 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than a wealthier neighborhood in the same city. When the floods come, their neighborhood floods first and foremost. And if the toxic waste, waste sites or the landfills flood, all of that gets washed into their homes. That is what does not give me hope. And I wanted to be clear about that because too often we place our hope in the wrong things and then we are disappointed. So what does give me hope? Where do I find that hope? I'm talking not about a hope where we bury our heads in the sand like the metaphorical ostrich. I'm not talking about a hope where we practice the power of positive thinking and just wish everything will be okay somehow by a miracle and maybe it will be. No. I am talking about a hope that begins, like you just said, this is, this is the, the paragraph you picked, Brett. A hope where we look the problem in the face. We recognize it is bad and it will get worse. We understand what is at stake, our civilization as we know it. That is what is at stake. The planet will survive. The question is, will we? Real hope accepts that success is not inevitable or even entirely probable. But what hope offers is the chance of a better future. The chance. And what determines that chance? How hard we fight for it. That's what determines that chance. And so that is why giving up is not an option. As long as there is even a ray of light at the end of that dark tunnel, I will fight, and I know you will fight too, for everyone we love, every place we love, and everything we love. That's why we are fighting. And that's what our hope provides, is a vision of a better future for everyone, everything, and every place that we love. That's what real hope is. And if people understood that, I think there'd be a lot less arguments over hope. So let me go back to the science for just a second because the science does offer some hope and here's where it is. 
This is a figure of the warming we have seen so far. And on the left-hand side, you have degrees Celsius. This is from the IPCC's Code Red report that came out in August. But at the bottom, you don't have time. We have carbon. And when you look into the future at those different colored futures, what will determine where we end up? Us. We will determine where we end up. Us humans. We are 100% in control here, us humans. And so the IPCC's conclusions, I think, are actually very hopeful in terms of the definition I gave for hope. These are their conclusions. Every action matters. Every bit of warming matters. Every year matters. Every choice matters. If that is not hopeful, I don't know what is. It means that we truly can make a difference. And I love these words from Catherine Wilkinson. I don't know if you're familiar with the book called All We Can Save. It's a compendium of 60 women's voices, and I see Brett is familiar with it, <laughs> 60 women's voices on climate change. And Catherine was one of the co-editors of this book, and as you can see, she spells her name the right way. I'm a little biased that way. But this is what she said, and this is so perfect that I picked her quote to end the last chapter in my book. It is a magnificent time to be alive at a moment that matters so much. We are living in a time that will be written about in the history books. In fact, it's up to us whether there are history books to write it in. We are living in a time when change is happening, when things are happening, when there is literally a civilization to be saved. So why aren't we moving ahead then? What's stopping us? It's not that we aren't worried. We are. Did you know that 70% of Americans are worried about climate change? 70%. I know there's those loud dismissives, though they're 8% of the population. Leave the dismissives to talk to themselves in their echo chamber. The rest of us are worried. But what's the problem? Read down there. We feel helpless and we don't know where to start when it comes to climate action. 50% of us feel helpless and don't know where to start until they join Citizens Climate Lobby. <laughs> but you are meeting the exact need that people have. People are already worried, but they don't know what to do. Here's the word for what we're missing. We are missing something called efficacy. And that is simply a fancy word for, if I do something, can I make a difference? If we do something, can we make a difference? That's what efficacy means. What changes our sense of efficacy? Well, first of all, the reason we don't have any is because we picture climate action as a giant boulder sitting at the bottom of an impossibly steep cliff with only a few hands trying to push it up. Literally, five, six, seven hands. That boulder is not budging an inch, and if we added our hands, it wouldn't budge an inch. So why bother? That's lack of efficacy. But when we start to look around us at all the changes that are happening around the world, somebody challenged me on Twitter today and they said, there's nothing happening. You can't even show one thing that's happening. So I said, well, here's one. 90% of new energy installed around the world last year was clean energy. Here's two. Clean energy garnered $35 billion in new investor um, uh, funds over the last year. Double that of, of the previous year. That's two things that's happened. They've already happened. And then I didn't even get into Texas. I'll get to Texas later. There's a lot happening in Texas or Iowa or wherever you live. When we start to look around, we realize that that giant boulder is already at the top of the hill and it is already rolling down the hill in the right direction. And I couldn't find a picture of this. So if you can find a picture, let me know. I couldn't find a picture with millions of hands on it. I want a picture of that giant boulder. If anybody's an artist, draw me one and I will use your picture everywhere. I want a picture of a giant boulder rolling down the hill in the right direction with millions of hands on it. And if I add my hand to a boulder that's already rolling down the hill, it will go a tiny bit faster. If I use my voice to encourage my place of work, my school, my university, my church, my neighborhood, my club, my sports team, if I use my voice to encourage all of us to add our hands together, it will go even a little bit faster. That's efficacy. When we know that when we add our hand, it will make a difference and that boulder will go faster. To quote Greta Thunberg, the one thing we need more than hope is action. But once we start to act, hope is everywhere. Joan Baez, 
the famous singer, said it a bit differently. She said the antidote to despair, the antidote to anxiety is action. Action and hope are intimately connected. Why are we hopeless? You just saw the survey results. Because we don't know what to do. What gives us hope? When we know what to do. That's what gives us hope. And where do we start? By doing the one thing that most people are not doing. And I said we're here, but technically I should change the we're to most people. Because I think you are doing it. You could probably do it a bit more, but you're doing it. What is it? It's not educating people that global warming is happening. Most people are already on board with it. It's talking about it. Whoops. Talking about it. We're not talking about it. We are not talking about it. And here's the connection. If we don't talk about it, why would people care? And if we don't care, why would we ever fix it? Why don't we talk about it? I've asked people this, and it's pretty clear that we don't talk about it because we don't think it matters to us personally here and now in ways that are relevant to us. We don't know how to communicate why it matters to others. We don't think there's anything positive we can do to fix it. We don't want to get in an argument or a fight or just end up more depressed than when we started. And I don't blame them. I don't either. So this brings me to the second question that everybody asks me. And I have been asked this question probably 200 times. Maybe actually, no, that's conservative. I'm a scientist. Probably more like 400 times. I've probably been asked this question 400 times by CCLers. And that's why I think everybody at CCL needs to read the book. <laughs> because this is your question. This is your question that I wrote the book for. How do I talk about this? How do I talk about this in a way that makes a difference? Because climate changes and we get worried. So our natural human instinct is to do what? I'm worried. Worried is sometimes a mild word. I might be panicked or scared, depressed. And so what do I do? I look around and I say, okay, if I'm going to talk about it, I'm going to load up with all the scariest facts I can find about Antarctica and sea level rise and polar bears. And I am just going to dump them on people so they'll be as worried as I am. So that's what we do. We scare more, we, we share more scary data with people and what happens? Well, according to neuroscience, if we learn about something that is very worrying, but we don't know what to do about it, our defense mechanisms kick in and we just disassociate. We just sort of mentally go back to bed and pull the covers over our head. Because if I can't do anything about it, what am I supposed to do anyways? I can't carry that anxiety around with me. It's not healthy. It isn't. And so our defense mechanisms kick in, shove it to the back of our mind. People reject it even more and inaction results. In my book, I quote a neuroscientist called Tally Sherratt because she has so many good things to say. She wrote her own book called The Influential Mind, if you're interested. And I promise you the influential mind is not about climate change, but I also promise you it is about climate change. She doesn't mention it, but it's all about climate change. And here's what she says here. She says, fear and anxiety will cause us to withdraw, to freeze, to give up rather than take action and climate changes more. And that is exactly what we're seeing today. People have given up because they're paralyzed with fear and anxiety and climate just changes more and then we're doomed. Okay, so if this is how not to talk about it, how should I talk about it? We have to address the two biggest problems. It's not that people aren't worried, they are. It's not that people don't know it's real, they do. I'm not talking about the eight percenters. I know that nothing can convince them and I don't think there's any point having a constructive conversation with them because you can't. Everybody else, everybody else knows it's real and is worried, but we have two problems. Problem number one, we think it, it's a future issue or a far away issue. It doesn't matter to me personally in my life. I have other priorities. Where do I fit it in? And very well-meaning people say this. They might have priorities that include, you know, racial justice or um, allevi alleviating poverty or running a soup kitchen or, you know, taking care of their kids or managing their health. We have very good priorities and we think, well, climate change can wait. But here's the thing. I don't think climate change should be on anybody's priority list at all because the only reason we care about it is because it affects number one, number two, number three, number four, five, six, seven, every single thing that's on our list. Climate change is an everything issue. So we think it doesn't matter and 
we think we don't have the solutions. But of course we do have the solutions, right? So here's what we do need to talk about. We need to talk about why and how it matters to us. And here's where you do an inventory, as I talk about in the book. Who are you? What do you love? I live in Texas. I can talk to people who live in Texas. I'm from Canada. I talk to people who are from Canada. I love skiing. I talk to people who love snow. I'm a mom. I talk to other parents. I'm a Christian. I talk to people who share my faith. I knit. And if you've read the book, you'll be laughing because I have literally started conversations over knitting that lead to climate change. I'm not going to tell you how. You have to read the book for that one. You can have conversations that start with baseball, tennis, beer, wine, beach vacations, military experience. And trust me, all these stories are all through the book. I'm not making any of this stuff up. You can start with anything that you genuinely care about. You could be a member of the Rotary Club or the Qantas Club or the Lions Club or the choir. You could be an artist. You could be a paddler. You could be a birder. You could be a gardener. Do an inventory of who you are. And actually, I'm going to ask you right now, put it in the chat. Put your inventory in the chat. Say, I am a, and give me like three things about yourself. Three words. I am a. Three words that you could begin a conversation with somebody else about. I was doing, um, I was talking to somebody from Skeptical Science the other day. You know, Skeptical Science, it's that, let me talk to you for a second here. It's that great website where they have answers to 200 commonly asked questions about climate change. So the guy I was talking to has worked at Skeptical Science for years. And he is all about having conversations about climate change. But when he read the book, he said, I realized an amazing thing. He said, I am a deep sea angler. I am very passionate about deep sea fishing. I am part of a very tight knit community that does it all the time. And I have never talked to them about climate change. Yet we can see the fish species changing over our lifetimes. We can see the seasons changing. We can see what's happening with the fish. I have never started a conversation with angling before, and now I will. So you can do that too, and I love what I'm seeing in here. So we've got a grandfather, a scientist, and somebody who loves the outdoors. We've got a software engineer, a musician, and somebody who's queer. We've got somebody who's a yogi, a birder, and an introvert. Yep. So introverts, it doesn't necessarily have to be your voice. You can be posting something. You can be sharing something. You can be writing something. It doesn't have to be actually verbally talking. When I say talking, it's more of a metaphor for expressing yourself. And you can express yourself in multiple ways, including through dance. I am not a dancer, so I will not be doing that. But that's something you can do. We've got somebody who's a fishmonger. Yes, you can definitely talk about it. A gardener, a Christian, a musician, a doctor, a tree lover, a swimmer, ooh, a pond hockey player. I've got that in my book. I tell stories about climate scientists who are hockey players, who are gamers, who talk about climate change on Twitch online. We've got a singer. You get the picture. That's where you start the conversation with other people who share that with you. And then what else do you do? You talk about all the positive things that are already happening. What is that? The hands on the boulder. You tell people that there are a million hands on the boulder. And how do you do that? By sharing examples of what? You can share examples of countries, right? You can share examples of companies. Microsoft, Google, Apple, Walmart, a carpet company that's producing negative carbon carpet. They are trapping carbon in the carpet and selling it to you. So when you renovate or build a place, preferably renovate, you can put in carbon negative carpet and be part of the solution. I mean, isn't that amazing? You can talk about what faith leaders are doing of all faiths, not just Christian. Every single faith has examples of people who are leaders in this area. I love, I promised, I was going to talk about Texas. I love talking about what happens in Texas. I have to say provinces too because I'm Canadian. We have 23% of our energy from wind and solar last year. It's going to be more this year. We are number one in wind and number two in solar, and we are going to be overtaking California very soon, unless you pull up your socks. We have the biggest army base in the U.S. by land area. Of course, it's Texas, but it's powered by clean energy. We have the first carbon neutral airport in the North America, DFW airport. We have the city of Houston. We have the city of Dallas. We have the city of Austin. We have the city of San Antonio who all have climate action plans. 
I love talking about what's happening where I live and you can do the same thing because I could make the same list for every single state that you're from, except I'm sorry, you will not be number one and win because Texas is still bad. But you could try to catch up. I love talking about organizations like who? Like Citizens Climate Lobby or the Nature Conservancy where I work now. Organizations are doing amazing things and they take volunteers and people can contribute if they want to join an organization and share and join and, and advocate for change. It's easier to do it with other people. So join something. I always tell people that. Young people are using their voices. We can learn from their example, can't we? We can talk about how our own lives are changing. Do individual choices matter? Yes and no. How do they not matter? Well, our footprint is pretty small, and if all of us who care changed what we eat and how we live, that wouldn't fix climate change. But we do one more thing. We talk about it. So you try a plant-based recipe and you talk about it. You um, reduce your food waste and you talk about it. You swap out your light bulbs and you talk about it. You get the plug-in car and you talk about it. You get the solar panels, that's actually my house right there, and it turns out they're contagious. The number one predictor of if someone has solar panels is if somebody else within a mile has them. Talk about what we're doing. Talk about what our schools are doing. Talk about what our city or our state is doing. Talk about what's happening around the world where clean energy is revolutionizing the lives of people in some of the poorest parts of the planet. Like I said, 90% of new energy last year was clean energy. So climate changes and we get worried and what do we do? We don't load up all those scary facts and dump them on people. We share what? Why it matters to us here and now in ways that are relevant as a birder, a gardener, a yogi, and positive constructive solutions, including using your voice to advocate for price on carbon. That's a very positive solution. People feel empowered and action results. And how does this compute with our brain? Let's go back to the neuroscience. The human brain is built to associate forward action with a reward, not avoiding harm. So reframe your message. So the information you provide induces hope, not dread. And when we do that, people change. That's how important hope is. You see, we've come full circle. By talking about it, we can induce hope. So I wanna close with two quick questions, and then I'm gonna take your questions. Does it work and is it enough? These are the questions I hear from people. They're like, act, talking, we don't need talking, we need action. I'm like, tell me how we're gonna act if we don't use our voices. That is the catalyst. And obviously talking is an action too. You have to make a choice to express yourself in some way. And again, talking, I don't necessarily always mean using your voice. I mean expressing yourself so that other people can see what matters to you and what real solutions look like. It is the first step. It's the catalyst. And is it enough? Well, I want to answer this with two examples. Number one, does it work? We tried this out. We made four minute long videos from an Air Force general talking about climate change as a national security issue, from Bob Inglis, who you know well, talking about the free market solutions to climate change, from a libertarian talking about how it affects our personal values, and from somebody you may recognize right down there talking about a Christian perspective on climate change and science. They aired these short videos on real social media out in three purple districts, and they tracked Republican and Democrat opinions on climate change. Republican, or sorry, Democrat opinions increased a little bit as people were exposed to these short videos. Republican opinions increased twice as much. Why? Because the conversation started with what? With something they shared. National security, personal liberties, free market, Christian faith. It really works when you begin with something you share with people because they listen. And then the question is, is it enough? Well, I didn't answer this question in my book, but I did answer it in a time essay that I wrote just a couple of weeks ago, and I want to just read you the conclusion to that essay. Let's think back at the ways that the wor our industrialized society has changed significantly in the past 200 years. And we're going to start with slavery. Change did not begin with the King of England rolling out of bed one morning and deciding to end the slavery in the Caribbean. The President of the United States did not wake up one morning and decide, oh, women need the vote. 
the National Party of South Africa did not just opt to end apartheid one day out of the blue. Change began when ordinary people of no particular power, wealth, or fame decided the world could and should be different. Who were the few names that we know and the many names that we do not know who shared and supported and fought for their visions of a better world? They were people who had the courage of their convictions, who used their voices to advocate for the systemic societal changes needed. We, we ordinary people, we are the ones who changed the world before and we are the people who can change it again. That is why talking matters because it activates our superpower of what? Of changing the world. So that's why I called my book, Saving Us. Thank you. Brett, you are so fast. You're just like popping all those links that I'm mentioning in the chat. So people, please appreciate what he is doing. He's doing an awesome job. He is like keeping you up to date on everything here that I mentioned. And if you don't know, you can click on the little three dots there to save the chat. And now we are going to go to your questions, which I know have been coming up. And it looks like we have a ton of them. Take it away, yes. Mary. Yes, we are ready. Thank you, Dr. Hayhoe, for that wonderful overview. Um, so first, uh, first question is, what was the most enjoyable part of writing a book like this? And what was the hardest part of writing this book? Oh, <laughs> um, probably the most enjoyable part was holding the finished copy in my hand. <laughs> um, the hardest part was writing it because I wrote, so the book itself is probably about 75,000 words. I wrote about 250,000 words. I wrote everything I could think of and all of these things that didn't make into the book and just sort of like winnowing it down and figuring out what to put in. And then the hardest chapters for me to write were I think probably the most important ones, the ones on fear and the ones on guilt. I wrote and rewrote those, ripped them apart, consulted with experts, rewrote them again, because I just felt like those are the core issues that we're struggling with. It's not knowledge, it's not understanding, it's not solutions. It's fear and guilt and hope. And so as you read the book, you might figure something out. And that is that the book is not actually a climate change book. The climate change is the icing. The cake itself is really, again, about fear, hope, how we get along and how we get to a better future. Because I feel like if we can fix climate change, if we can come together on the most contentious issue in the US, we can come together on anything. So this book is really a guide to truly saving us in every sense of the world, not, word, not just from climate change, but from all of the conflicts and the fear, the divisiveness and the guilt that paralyzes us and that divides us, if we can figure out how to come together, that's how we can truly save ourselves. Wonderful. Um, so this question is getting upvoted a lot now that folks are looking at the at poll EV. Uh, the question is, how do you respond to young people who feel helpless to affect change on the conditions of the planet? So um, when I was making our Global Weirding series, and we have one more, one more season coming out. So if you have not subscribed to Global Weirding, you should go do so right now. Brett's going to put the link in the chat, I'm very sure. Um, and you can just go to YouTube and subscribe. Um, when, I was, when I do the Global Weirding series, I answer frequently asked questions. And so one of the questions that I hear is, I'm just a kid, what can I do? So I researched what kids are doing. Oh my goodness, kids are amazing. They are doing the most incredible things that put adults to shame. So now what I'm just a kid, what can I do is the most popular episode. That's the one that has the most views. It is the most positive episode. And so if you have a young person who feels discouraged, like nothing they can do to make a difference, just look at what kids are doing. They are inventing algae biofuel in an, an experimental apparatus that they built under their bed until their mom made them move into the garage. They are suing federal governments in Germany and Canada and the United States for their right to a better future. They are serving on city boards and panels to help their city build resilience to a changing climate. Kids are doing amazing things. And if you just show your kid what other kids are doing, your child will get their own ideas or you can do it with them and do something with them. Take your kid along to something that you're doing with, you know, volunteer for the nature conservancy, go to a nature preserve, pick up trash, go around the house and do an energy audit of your house and then decide how, what you're gonna do to reduce your own footprint. Do something with your kids because kids don't know the word impossible and they'll get many better ideas than we do. And then we'll end up being inspired by them rather than the other way around. Awesome. 
Um, this question is about uh, building coalitions. So this person says, in writing the book, did you come across uh, or do you offer any advice for CCLers looking to build coalitions with other climate groups? So about just working together on this issue. I am a big fan of coalition building. There is no time to waste in reinventing wheels. No time at all. Every, remember, every year counts, every choice counts, every bit of warming counts. And so anybody who's willing to be on board as a good faith actor, who is willing to focus on what we have in common rather than what divides us, I'm there and I feel like CCL should be too. Now, sadly, there are people, and I run into them almost every day on social media, who they've drawn lines in the sand and they're like, I will not do anything with you unless you obey this list of 10 green commandments. And that isn't helpful because my point is, you know what? I literally don't even care if somebody agrees with my science. I don't. As long as we're on the same board, the same page on solutions, let's work on the solutions together. The science we can work out later. So let's focus on what we have in common. That exercise I did where you identify what we are. So with organizations, what you do is you want to identify priorities. So it might be a mutual interest and focus on justice issues or on you know, alleviating flooding in your local area, or on educating and energizing kids. Identify what you have in common, where you intersect, and focus on that. That's great advice, as we knew it would be. <laughs> um, so this, that actually is sort of a good segue into this next question, which is how do you have a conversation with someone who is skeptical that the, the climate is changing fast enough that we need to do something about it? So not an outright denier, but maybe someone who isn't sure we need to pull out all the stops right now. How do you approach that conversation? Well, that was already covered by what I said, because remember, what's the first thing we need to talk about? How climate change matters to us here and now in ways that are relevant to us. Because when you survey people across the country, just about everybody agrees it's real, it will affect future generations, it will affect people in developing countries, it will affect plants and animals, but then you say, do you think it will affect you personally? And people are like, no, I don't think so. So that's the biggest problem we have. It's actually got, got a name to it, it's called psychological distance. And so with those people, it's even more important to talk about what's happening right here, what's happening right now, and how it's affecting something that we care about right here. The smoke, the wildfire smoke in the air that our kids or our grandchildren are breathing in. The fact that our neighbors are flooding or the fact that the favorite place where we used to fish is completely different than it used to be. Or there's, you know, wh whatever it is, make sure that you talk about it in really concrete terms. No ice sheets, no polar bears, unless you literally live in Churchill, Manitoba, in which case, yes, talk about the polar bears. No sea level rise unless you live on the coast. Somebody once asked me, um, how do you talk about polar bears in Iowa? And I said, you don't, you talk about corn. How do you talk about polar bears in Texas? You don't, you talk about hurricanes. How do you talk about polar bears in California? You don't, you talk about wildfire, drought, and crazy, crazy rainstorms. We talk about it again here, now, and in ways that are relevant and concrete to whoever you're talking to. And if you don't know what's relevant to them, you need to be asking them questions and getting to know them first. Okay. Um, CCL has a, a book study action team that I know is gonna be digging into the book. Um, is there a book study guide generally for available for the book uh, yet or already? There is not yet, but okay. there is going to be. So I have a great person helping me work on discussion questions. And we're also doing an annotated reading list because some people will be using this in classes. So some journal articles and books if people want to read more. We're also going to be doing some class activities. And I'm going to be making some little short videos. So if you're doing this with a book club, I'll have a little video for each section of the book, five videos in total that sort of take some of what I talked about today and some other stuff and put it all together. And we'll have little short videos and questions. Ooh, they volunteered a test guide, the study guide. That's excellent. So if you have suggestions for study questions, because CCLs is actually even starting already. I'll, I'll share my document with you, Brett, but then you guys can share your questions with me and you can help me come up with good questions. Awesome. What a treat. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. Um, 
So, okay, this last question has gotten quite a few uh, upvotes. What can CCLers be doing more of? And I know you said talk about it. Uh, I, I think we all have, have heard and are doing our best on that advice. Um, is there anything beyond that that you would recommend we ramp up in this important time? Um, uh Yes, I, I would say um, let's be creative in exploring opportunities to express what we're doing. Like remember the man from Skeptical Science? He was just as sold out as the most sold out CCLer and just as dedicated and spending just as much of his time, yet he had never thought about reaching out to his angling community before. So, you know, do that inventory and sort of think, who have I not talked to? Because something I often hear from people is they say, well, I don't talk about it because everybody already feels the same way as I do. And I'm like, well, first of all, A, how do you know that? <laughs> and B, are they activated? And if they're not activated, then talk to them about it, about why it matters and about what you can do to fix it. So somebody, if you don't mind, I'm just going to riff off a couple of these super quickly. Um, somebody said, you know, what's the median amount of time it takes? The answer to that is it depends. It can be, if you're very lucky, very lucky, a single conversation, but usually it takes some time. Some time is very normal. It takes me time to digest. I take time to digest. If I hear something new, I sort of mull it over in the back of my mind and it can take me days or even weeks, even if it's a pretty minor thing. So don't be discouraged if you don't see results immediately. And um, for me, like this is an aspect for me personally where my faith really comes into play because I, I, I truly believe that it's up to us to do what we're called to do but the results are not up to us because we don't control other people. This is the doctrine of free will. <laughs> Everybody has a free will. And I think we would all agree with that no matter who we are. Every one of us has a free will and we can't control other people. So we have responsibility over what we do and what we say to people, but we can't control others. And in fact, it's not the loving thing to do to try to control others. All we can do is express love towards them through caring about them, learning about them, connecting the dots for them to how climate change matters and recognizing that if they are worried, they probably feel helpless and hopeless. And so the best thing we can do is show them how many millions of hands are on that boulder through positive constructive stories and personal examples and examples of things that are happening in your own community, helping them see that they are not alone, that they can make a difference because that's ultimately what we all wanna do in this world is really make a difference. I don't know how long it takes, but you know what? It's not up to you. That is not up to you. It is only up to you to do what you're called to do and let the chips fall where they may. There's so much wisdom in that, <laughs> releasing the things that we can't control and just being in charge of ourselves. Well, isn't it that, um, that old prayer The you know, God give me the wisdom to, what is it? That it's the, um, the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the well, now I'm not going to remember it. But the last part is the wisdom to know the difference. What is, oh, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Exactly. <laughs> and what we can't do, thank you, Lisa. What we can't do is force other people to change. Right. Yes. Yep. Um, well, so we, we have about nine minutes left until the bottom of the hour. Um, and one thing that hasn't, I haven't seen pop up in the questions yet, but that I know is, uh, is on the horizon is the COP26, the UN Climate Conference. And um, so do you want to maybe take these last few minutes to sort of zoom out and talk about, uh, talk about that a little bit? I would love to do that. Um, let me just do a, a super quick, like 30 second speed round, just so people think we did, we saw their, we saw your questions. Sure, sure. So, okay, people are asking about the methane catastrophe. I have news for you. This is what I study. The more carbon we produce, the greater the risks of really unpleasant surprises. That is the bottom line. And that's all we need to know. Our future's in our hands. How much carbon we produce is up to us. And the more carbon we produce, the greater the risk of really bad surprises. So how do we reduce those really bad surprises? By cutting our carbon emissions. How do we start cutting our carbon emissions? By telling people why it matters and what we can do to fix it. Just keep that perspective in mind. Do not go down the rabbit holes. Do not get lost in the woods or the details. More carbon, worse impacts. What do we do? Help people understand why we need to fix it. Um, you can definitely share this. Brett will be posting it on Facebook. Um, our climate models, are pretty much showing the same thing that they did 50 years ago. And in fact, I'll put a great link in the chat to that if you're interested in that. Um, and 
the, this message testing on how to most of, oh, is there any message testing on how to most effectively communicate with the six categories of six America's global warming? Of course there is, and I just gave it to you. Of the six categories, leave the dismissives alone. Nothing's gonna work with them. All the other categories, start with something they care about, connect the dots to climate change, and bring in positive constructive solutions. Depending on where they fall, one or the other might be more important, but they're both important and they work with everybody because everybody's a human and everybody cares about something. Whether it's their dog, whether it's the game that they play on, on Twitch, whatever it is, they have something they're passionate about. All right, let's talk about COP. So this didn't pop up in the question. So I just, yeah. I'll just sort of generally toss you a softball of thoughts, mm -hmm. thoughts on COP. <laughs> So um, I'm going to Glasgow next week, along with you know every other country in the world and all kinds of other people, to basically what I see, and I talk about this in the book actually, what I see as a global potluck dinner. All the countries in the world are going with their contribution to the Paris target, to keep warming below two degrees if we can, and 1.5 even better. So along will come the United States with a big apple pie. When we cut into it, will it be full of hot air? We don't know the answer to that question yet, and that's why it's such an important time to call your elected representative. Another country will show up with an old fish finger they dragged out of the back of the freezer, and they'll put it on the table and everybody will see it. Another country, like Costa Rica or Bhutan or the Gambia, will show up with a giant fresh pasta salad with homemade dressing and some bread they made themselves. That's what COP is. It's a global potluck to see who's bringing what, to two different things. This is important. It's not just about cutting emissions, which is important, but it's also about the Green Climate Fund. It's something called climate finance. So if you see people saying climate finance, what that means is all of the countries agreed, the rich countries who've caused most of the problem, 12 countries are causing like 70% of carbon emissions these days. It's not a lot. All the rich countries agreed to put money into a reparations fund for low-income countries to help them develop without producing more carbon and adapt to the impacts they can't avoid anymore. Where do we stand? The United States has put in 20% of the money it promised. Canada has put in 40% of the money it promised. Only Norway has put in 100% of the money it promised. So there's going to be a lot of discussions about what dish they're bringing to the table in terms of their emission reductions. And there's going to be a lot of discussion about climate finance, how they're contributing to the Green Climate Fund to help the low-income countries, the 3.5 billion people who produce 7% of emissions, adapt and prepare for the impacts of a changing climate. We'll all be watching to see how it goes. It's so crucial. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing. Uh, that I would love for you to touch on if you have, I think we have a few minutes, we can squeeze this in. Yeah. Um, so you are doing some work with the Nature Conservancy. I believe your role is chief scientist there. Um, do you wanna tell us about, uh, about that work? Yes, so this summer I accepted a position as chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy, which is the largest global conservation organization in the whole world. There are over 400 scientists working in over 70 countries around the world on all kinds of amazing, amazing projects related to conservation, restoration, agriculture, rural health, even urban greening projects. The Nature Conservancy does it all. What I love is the fact that they focus primarily on nature-based solutions, where we're using nature to clean up our air and filter our water and provide habitat. Oh, and take up carbon too. Because did you know that nature, first of all, the, the biosphere, on the terrestrial biosphere alone, has a hundred times more carbon than humans have produced since the dawn of the industrial era. The ocean has a hundred times more carbon than humans have produced since the dawn of the industrial era. And carbon in the soil and in ecosystems is a good thing. When we restore carbon to the soil, it's a fertilizer. When we put carbon into ecosystems, they're healthier. Nature-based solutions could remove as much as 30% of our carbon emissions from the atmosphere. And while doing so, again, they would clean up our air and filter our water and provide habitat. And along the coast, like mangrove forests and coastal wetlands, they would protect us from stronger storm surges from bigger, stronger hurricanes. So nature-based solutions are so practical. Nature-based solutions would benefit hugely from a price on carbon, 
which is why the Nature Conservancy supports a price on carbon. And I love the fact that we can work on solutions that are win, win, win. Oh, and also they take carbon out of the atmosphere, win too. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for all of this wonderful information. I've seen folks putting in the chat that they're feeling re-energized, they're feeling inspired, they're feeling encouraged. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Hayhoe. Uh, and I will, I think, pass it over to Brett now to, to wrap up our time together. Yeah, absolutely. I don't want to, um, I'll give you the last word here, Dr. Hale, but I'll give you three quick reminders, everyone. So this recording will be available on CCL's YouTube channel as of tomorrow. So feel free to click that link. The reminder to get your book while you still can before a second printing is in order. That link is also in the chat. It's an amazing work that will absolutely inspire you, especially in these times that we need it. And if you'd like to dive into that book, we do have a book study that was referenced in that poll EV. It's in the chat as well. It's coming up three Wednesdays, different dates, uh, or uh, same time, but three different dates, November 17th, December 1st, and the 15th. Join the Book Study Action Team, and they'd love to have you for that upcoming discussion. Um, so with that, thank you all for joining us, and we'll pass it to you for the final word and the final minute here, Dr. Hayhoe. Well, thank you so much, everybody. This is just fantastic. Uh, thank you for your great comments there. <laughs> um, thank you for everybody who's joining the book discussion and thank you for everything you do because part of what gives me hope, some of those hands on that boulder, it's you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.